All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem-Based Management Tools Network, EBM Tools Network for short. Uh, the network is co-coordinated by NatureServe and OpenChannels.org and we're very glad you could be with us here today, um, especially anyone who is on the east coast of the U.S. and, and, and blizzarded in. Um, we're very happy to welcome today uh, Ben Halpern of NCES, the National Center for Ecological Assessment and Synthesis, uh, and he is also with the University of California, Santa Barbara, and Steve Katona, who is with Conservation International. And they're going to be speaking today about drivers and implications of change in global ocean health as demonstrated by the Ocean Health Index. Uh, before we, I turn it over to those guys, um, I wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions. There are two ways to ask questions. You can uh, raise your virtual hand, there's a little hand icon in the user interface. Um, you can raise your virtual hand, I can unmute you, and you can ask the question directly to uh, Steve and Ben. Um, this only works if you have a working microphone um, or if you've entered the PIN number if you're using the phone option. The other way we do questions, and honestly it's the way we do most of the questions, is for you to type the questions into the question panel of the user interface, um, and then I would relay the questions to uh, Steve and Ben that way. Um, with this option, feel free to send in questions at any point during the webinar. Uh, we'll hold substantive questions till the question and answer at the end of the presentation, but quick clarifying questions, I might go ahead and ask the speakers uh, as they're presenting. But anyway, feel free to use that option throughout the presentation. Okay, well, welcome, uh, Ben, Steve. Um, I'll, I'll turn it over to you now. We're very pleased you could be with us today. Well, um, hi, everyone. Thanks, Sarah, and uh, it's great to be here today. Um, I want to say that uh, underlying the title of the talk that you see on, on your screens uh, are a whole bunch of questions uh, such as like what is ocean health and how could you measure it, uh, how could you detect change, um, if you did detect change is it significant, what, how much is significant and what's the practical significance of any of this information anyway. So. I'll be giving um, introductory comments on some of those questions in the first part of this webinar and then uh, Ben will have most fun because he's going to discuss um, some of the results and implications that we think are um, really exciting. So um, Ben's driving, so please, there we go. Uh, the outline of the talk, as I say, is um, we'll, I'll develop the um, uh, conceptual ideas behind the uh, index and some of its framework. And then Ben's going to talk about um, the uh, uh, methods in more, more detail and trends that we've seen and um, some of the independent assessments that are ongoing as well as the open science that's underlying this whole project. Go ahead. Ben, go ahead. So um, everybody notices that oceans are changing. Um, not hard to see. Most of the changes that people uh, note or comment on are negative. Um, and Ben and um, his team in 2008 provided the first global map of cumulative impacts of 17 uh, key pressures on oceans and coasts. Uh, in 2008 that was, and they repeated it in 2015, the bottom line being that nearly all of the ocean and coasts are affected by uh, multiple pressures. So back in 2008, um, and partly inspired by that project, um, I began work on um, what was going to develop into the Ocean Health Index, uh, working with the New England Aquarium and Conservation International and National Geographic. And what we were trying to do is to um, figure out some way to measure um, ocean status and progress um, toward uh, improvement. And what we planned to do at the time was to ascertain current values for a series of key pressures and set five-year targets for amelioration and compare the rates of change to what would be needed to reach those targets. Um, luckily, I was able to recruit Ben to be a member of the Scientific Advisory Board and um, he emphasized that assessing negative 
pressures was only one side of the coin because most pressures actually resulted from human actions that created benefits for someone. So it was important to track not only the negative things, but also what benefits were being um, obtained. So in any case, it, it, at first it seemed like um, the project was going to be simple because we would eliminate all the pressures, um, we'd restore the ocean to pristine condition, and everything would be well. But the problem was that doing that would essentially eliminate all contact between people and oceans and coasts, whether it was direct or indirect. Um, so that really wasn't going to work. Um, and um, it, it would really eliminate all the benefits that people obtain from the ocean, whether um, tourism, recreation, fishing, aquaculture, shipping, jobs, and so forth. So that wasn't going to be possible. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the question uh, really came down to be, what is healthy? Um, how would you characterize a healthy ocean? Uh, recognizing that people and our effects were everywhere. And um, did it really make sense to try and uh, get the ocean back to pristine condition. Next slide, please. So the um, project took on a very different character which focused on benefits, the positive things that humans were getting um, from the ocean. So um, what happened was that in 2010, Ben and Karen McLeod invited me to join a workshop that was starting at ENSYS. It was called uh, Ocean Health in the Context of Ecosystem-Based Management. It was funded by the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, and it included uh, 25 scientists and social scientists. And over a period of a year and a half, the group developed a model for a way to measure and track both the pressures and the benefits that people receive from the ocean in an integrated manner, and we called it the Ocean Health Index. Next, please. And the first thing that we uh, had to do was to define what a healthy ocean was, and this was the definition that we came up with. Um, a healthy ocean sustainably delivers a range of benefits to people now and in the future. Um, I suppose some of you anyway remember that um, in the 1990s there was a huge controversy about whether the term health could actually be used for any unit larger than an individual. It could groups or habitats or ecosystems or God forbid the ocean be characterized as healthy. So lots of ink was spilt on that kind of discussion, but nonetheless the, um, the metaphor prevailed, it was strong, people understood it even if they didn't understand the details, and um, as long as health was defined appropriately, everybody seemed to find the term useful. So this definition um, is really about health, but defined in an anthropomorphic way. So the focus is on the health of human communities and people that rely on oceans and coasts for health and well-being. However, that continued um, health can only be achieved if the water and habitats and species and ocean wildlife are also healthy, not necessarily pristine, but healthy enough so that they can continue to deliver benefits in perpetuity. And so the, the perspective is definitely not about measuring how pristine a system is, although it can certainly contain pristine parts, but rather how healthy the coast, sea, and people are 
together as a system and how well they're functioning together. Next, please. So the Ocean Health Index was created mainly because no other such instrument existed, or at least we couldn't find it. And we thought that an assessment like this was needed at all levels, uh, globally as part of a planetary dashboard of indicators of how the whole um, uh, globe was doing, but also at all scales and levels of jurisdiction so that it could be used as a guide in policy making and management. And the main ob objectives, as you see, were to um, look at the system as a coupled hu human ocean um, uh, enterprise and to try and make the th a lot of complex stuff um, boil down to some easy to understand metrics to uh, incorporate sustainability everywhere through the thing um, in all the indicators as part of the reference points, we'll get to that, and to be able to track progress through time both um, in the future but also where possible looking back into the past to see how uh, whether there has been any progress over time already. Um, and then mainly to stimulate actions that would improve ocean health. So next please. The the project was uh, published in 2012 in Nature, and as you can see, there are a lot of co-authors, um, and all of the ones listed were part of that initial NCS workshop, and uh, the paper was the first crack at um, describing the conceptual and scientific framework uh, used um, to, for assessment and, and to apply it. Uh, using the globally uh, accessible data um, to all of the world's coastal countries and their territories. Next, please. So um, we created or hoped we created an integrated assessment uh, that was based on specific goals that were broadly shared and explicit reference points. And the, uh, the system was going to be measured in terms of its current status, the five-year trend of that status, the pressures that were going to depress status or, or, or were already doing it, and um, resilience to those pressures. Um, we'll talk about that later. And it was to be applied globally uh, at first, but also to be um, scalable, tailorable to any study area of any size. We don't know how small um, it can get, but we're down to some um, portions of, of uh, national coastlines and some large bays at least. So let's go next, please. Um, so let me just say um, that this, assist, this assessment method is designed to assist with ecosystem-based management. It's not a synonym for ecosystem-based management, but it's part of the uh, management cycle. Um, and the idea is to be able to use results to guide planning and actions that improve overall health. So it started out with um, goals, 10 goals, which were uh, determined by the participating scientists and other economists and sociologists reviewing uh, published studies as well as white papers and so forth and interviews too about what people want and expect from a healthy ocean and all of those responses were gathered together into uh, 10 goals which generally describe the benefits that the ocean provides to people. Four of those goals you'll see have little silver stars on their shoulders, and those each have two sub-goals. Um, and all of that, we'll see how it works out. Keep going, please, Ben. So um, what are the indicators that were used? Well, there are lots of them, something like 
80 or even more in the uh, initial uh, global study. And indicators um, are used sometimes for more than one goal. For example, here's a what's supposed to be a halibut. And um, typically, you might, uh, might include tons of fish caught. Um, and you'd refer it to a seafood goal, the food provision goal. But um, so that information would also be useful in other ways, too. The, the amount of uh, tons of halibut caught would also be providing revenue um, and jobs to coastal communities and economies. And the presence of the fish or sufficient amounts of the fish would also be able to determine um, uh, be a determinant of uh, opportunities for artisanal uh, fishers or indigenous people to fish. So um, each data stream may be used in different ways and different goals um, in, in ways that are specifically referred to ref goal-specific reference points. So we try and get as much as we can out of each uh, data stream, use it in all the ways that it can be used and should be used. Next, please. So um, the core methodology looks like this. For each of the goals, and there are 10 of them, um, there's uh, fisheries, clean waters, tourism, recreation, um, artisanal fishing opportunities, uh, carbon sequestration, um, all kinds of things that we don't have to go into now, but they're generally agreed upon uh, by the population as a whole. Some more valuable in some places than in others, but in each case, the um, current status of each goal is determined with reference to a uh, reference point or an established target. And that is going to be half the value of that goal. Go ahead to the next slide, please. The other half is called likely future status. Um, and it's not projecting way into the future, but it's in the next five years. And it's basically um, determined by the trend of the past five years of status values the pressures that are going to decrease status and the responses in ecological resilience, but mostly social resilience, the actions that people take to reduce pressures. Next, please. So the whole thing um, in the next slide, did it get, uh, yeah, looks like that. Half the uh, goals, half of the score for each goal is the current status. The other half is the likely future status. They're calculated, as I mentioned, and that gives a score for each goal. Next, please. The scores for each goal are then averaged to produce the overall score for the region that's being evaluated. And that overall score is usually expressed as a flower plot where the length of the petals indicates the score of the goal and the width of the, of the petal gives the relative value. For the global studies, each one is 10% of the score. They're all equally weighted. And um, so we illustrate the values like this. So it's a, a single number that expresses a whole lot of complications underneath. Um, that, of course, gains some critique, but the, it's all um, searchable and you can go down and find out scores underlying and the scores of each of the components and so forth. Go ahead, Ben. So uh, global assessments were um, are done annually. The first published in 2012, that one, and the 2013 uh, were published uh, in scientific journals. The 2016 is in review, and um, all of that information is available uh, not only in the published um, papers, but also online in the um, general website 
uh, which you'll see at the end of the presentation. Next, please. The um, number of regions assessed, the reporting areas, it's 220, all coastal nations and their territories. And um, things uh, change in the model and the data available every year. And so the, um, the model is updated annually. Um, it also was updated in response to any critiques, um, either external or internal. For instance, we had a lot of back and forth on fisheries me methods and mariculture reference points and so forth. But each time the model is changed uh, and we believe improved, all of the previous results are recalculated so that everything is comparable year to year, even though it wouldn't seem so if you looked at the papers uh, from the past separately. So you look at the most recent um, results and that takes care of everything. Next please. Um, the method itself has had increasing uptake. It's being used as an indicator in uh, IEG target 14 of the Convention on Biological Diversity being considered for use in goal 14, the ocean goal of um, the sustainable development goals. Next, please. So it, we believe it's having some, um, some impact and will be of use in, in management. Um, the, in addition to the uh, status, um, to, the, to the score, we also look at uh, trends, um, and the trends have been published for those years. And um, Ben's going to be talking about details of, uh, that we've found for trends in his portion of the talk. Um, next slide, please. And this begins uh, Ben's portion. Um, and I, I would like to mention that Ben is the chief scientist uh, for the Ocean Health Index. He has been with the project from its start since before this uh, current format uh, developed. And um, it, it's, uh, his cumulative impact work is also wrapped into uh, the pressures indicators um, of the Ocean Health Index. So uh, it's fair to say without Ben, there wouldn't be an Ocean Health Index. So Ben, take it away. Thanks so much, Steve. Um, that was a great introduction and foundation for what we've done and how we've gotten to where we're at now. Um, so I want to present to you the results that are, are in review right now uh, for publication that focus on um, the last five years of our assessment. So as Steve said, the first two years have been published, but we've had three additional years of scores calculated. And so we have five years now that starts to be enough years to, of assessment to um, see how trends and trajectories are going. But it also gives us um, a chance to kind of uh, reflect and actually um, assess how well the index as a tool is performing as an indicator. As, as Steve said, there's, the calculation of it includes um, sort of a, an assessment of the current status and a, a likely future status. And that likely future status projects uh, essentially five years into the future where we think things will be. So now that we've done five years of assessment, we can actually compare what the first year of assessment thought we would be at today and um, see how well it predicted. So I'm going to walk you through uh, the results we found uh, that give us a sense of the sort of the drivers, potential drivers and consequences of change in ocean health at a global scale, but also dive a little bit into um, how well the index is performing because we think it's always really important to uh, evaluate the underlying data, the underlying science, and the underlying framework of the index as you move forward to constantly improve it. Uh, so there's a lot. You know, one of the challenges in, in talking about global results 
over five years is there's lots and lots of detail that we can dive into. So I'm just going to scratch the surface here and, and show you some of the big picture results that we present. Um, as Steve mentioned, the, the data and results are all currently freely available online at our website. So if you get intrigued, you can dive deeper and explore the results yourself uh, for any particular country um, or goal that you're interested in. You can also download all the data and do uh, other analyses with it. We really welcome people uh, taking that stuff and running with it. Um, so as you can see here, uh, the um, scores for 2016 last year um, show uh, similar patterns to what we saw in the initial analyses uh, from back in 2012 where the scores range from the 50s or high 40s up until the low 90s uh, for different regions with places in Africa and the Caribbean um, showing some of the lowest scores and uh, places in remote uh, areas in the South Pacific and Southern Ocean, as well as some other uh, developed places like the Seychelles and Germany that are scoring quite high. So it, uh, it has some of the similar uh, messages we saw uh, from the beginning that the scores can be high in both uh, remote, uninhabited, uh, quote unquote, pristine places, but also in highly developed, highly populated places that are managing their resources more sustainably. And we see the lowest scores in places where you generally have a confluence of um, political instability, um, poverty, uh, and other social factors uh, that, uh, and poor governance that just make it difficult for countries to manage their resources when they're just dealing with a lot of other issues, which you see, um, unfortunately, a lot in, in many of the African countries. Uh, the scores um, are not that much different from uh, in 2015. Uh, you know, at a global scale, and we'll talk more about this in, in a minute, uh, a single number doesn't change much from year to year, and you wouldn't expect it to if the global entire ocean were changing rapidly, we'd have some serious concerns on our hands. We wouldn't expect it, that score to change. At a country level, you can see scores change um, year to year, uh, although again, the single index score shouldn't change dramatically. Uh, and then as you dive in deeper, you can see individual goal scores changing more and more. So uh, at a global scale, we're not seeing um, substantial changes as one would expect. But you can start to look at the, the trends, like I said, which is, gets really interesting. Where are we seeing um, uh, larger year-to-year -year changes, either increases or decreases? So what you're looking at here in this uh, figure is the per country or territory change year-to-year -year with um, the maximum being um, five points uh, each year and, and the minimum being negative about four or five points per year. So those are large changes in those particular countries over a five-year period. That's you know, anywhere from 15 to 20 points overall change. Um, and you can see a lot of places are seeing very small changes. Anything that's colored um, that kind of very light blue or the very light yellow, which is most countries, are hardly changing at all, less than a point in either direction. And the largest changes, the deeper blues and the deeper reds, are really very few countries. You see uh, some parts of, of Norway and uh, Eritrea, and I think it is in the Red Sea, um, and a few other places that are seeing um, large changes uh, at the overall index score. So of course, this sets the kind of the big picture, the foundation for then asking, well, why? What's going on? Why are these places changing or not changing, can we use the index to tell us more about the drivers of these changes? Um, part of that is to ask what's going on uh, with individual goals at a global scale. So this is the these flower plots we use to represent um, <clears throat> and I visualize what's underneath the hood for individual index scores. So this is the global score. Globally, the oceans were, given a score of 71, <clears throat> which is not great, it's not too bad, it's kind of in the middle, plenty of room for improvement. And you can see here that um, the, the petals that are longer and colored blue are the ones that have higher scores, closer to their reference point of 100, and ones that are yellow and orange are lower and further from their reference point. 
as Steve said, they're all equally weighted except for fisheries and mariculture, which we weight by the relative proportion of um, biomass that's produced from those two. And you can see that so far in countries, at least what's reported and traded globally, mariculture is a much, much smaller proportion of uh, food provision than fisheries, so it's, it's weighted a lot less. So you can see that um, food provision, natural products, tourism, recreation, and this uh, sub-goal of lasting special places are the ones that are further from the reference points and are pulling the global score down. This is similar to what we saw in earlier assessments. And um, measures of biodiversity, species, and habitats, um, coastal protection, coastal economies, these are the ones that are doing are closer to their reference points, uh, still have room for improvement, um, but are helping bring the score up. So this starts to give you a sense of where there's room for improvement, where you might want to focus energy on increasing uh, the scores and the underlying um, drivers of those goals at a global scale. That was just the snapshot of what's going on in 2016. Of course, what's really interesting is this, the change in these goal scores, and that helps explain what you're seeing in the change of those country-level scores. So in this plot, we see the overall global index on the top uh, line, and each of the goals or sub-goals uh, in lines below that. If uh, the, the sub-goal, if it's a sub-goal, it has the goal in parentheses after it. So you can see lasting special places is a sub-goal of sense of place. Now you can see this is the global average change in the goal with um, the blue dots are unweighted by the size of the EEZ, so each country is simply just averaged to get that score, and the yellow dots are weighted by the size of the EEZ, so the area weighted ones give you kind of a, a sense of what's driving global scores, and the blue ones might give you a bit of a sense better sense of what's driving individual country scores. And on the right are sort of um, spark line type plots that are the y-axis is scaled to the change in that goal, so they're not comparable to each other up and down, but they give you a sense of the trajectory over time for that particular goal. So, for example, the top one of the index, the change is very small, it's between 70 and 71, so it looks like these big changes that it goes up to a tiny bit in the first year and then declines for the following years, but really small amounts. Whereas the next one, lasting special places, it's actually increasing a number of points year on year. So again, the y-axis on those spark line plots are, are scaled to the goal, not comparable to each other. So you can immediately see uh, here, as we sort of kind of intuited from the flower plot is the, the things that have um, uh, changed the most and in some sense had the most room for improvement was the lasting special places, which is the protection within marine protected areas of different areas that help protect those places that kind of define the, the cultural value that people derive from special places in the ocean, has increased by nearly a point, whether unweighted or or uh, weighted averages. Fisheries have increased um, about a half point globally, uh, in, in particular due to fisheries reforms that have helped make more sustainable fisheries practices in some places, which has helped boost the food provisioning goals. So the, the four goals that have increased the most, or I guess the two goals, sub-goals that have increased the most lasting special places in fisheries helped drive up those overall goals of food provision and sense of place as well. Uh, I forgot to mention the open circles are those that are not significantly different from zero, but all the solid circles are significantly different from zero. And then you can see the greatest declines are uh, in coastal protection, which is from habitats that protect coastlines from storm damage and erosion, uh, declines in tourism and recreation, and then most dramatically uh, declines in natural products. So natural products are the things that we harvest from the ocean not for direct human consumption but for trade such as shells or coral or sponges or seaweed, things like that. So this starts to give us a sense that the biggest picture, the things that are driving changes globally and within countries, um, and of course then you can start to dive deeper into understanding those. Um, another way of just kind of Visualizing this is to, or to sort of understand it, I guess, is to look at how 
um, sort of countries have that are doing well or not as well have changed over time. So what you're seeing here in this plot uh, is the scores that countries had in the latest year of assessment, 2016, and their average change in scores over the uh, previous five years of assessment. And the ones in orange are just orange uh, to help um, highlight a few countries. They're, they're not significant otherwise, but it helps you. We wanted to label a few so you knew some of the identity of these countries that were um, changing more. And what you can see here basically with this, it's um, significant but not strongly significant in a slope upwards is showing that countries that um, have higher scores now tended to increase more over time in the uh, assessments and scores. Countries that had lower scores tended to decrease over time. So it's a, a bit of the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Um, and you know this is an interesting result from our perspective because it shows that, or at least implies, that the things that are in place, uh, whether ecologically or from a social governance economic perspective, that are helping countries get higher scores uh, along the many dimensions of ocean health, also are helping them improve their scores. And places that are um, maybe don't have as uh, good governance or social or economic institutions in place uh, to promote sustainability or have eroded natural capital uh, in those places are seeing their scores slip further down. So it's a cautionary tale of the need for intervention in places that seem to be getting worse over time and perhaps a, a cause for um, uh, celebration or a happiness about how countries that are doing well continue to do well and maybe some case studies and guidance on how we can borrow from those places that are lessons we can borrow from those places that are doing well and see how we can apply them to places that are seeing their scores decline. So um, you know, we can start to dive deeper and deeper to understand for any particular country uh, what is driving the overall change in their scores. So this um, plot, and there's a few of these that I'll show you, uh, look at countries, um, the horizontal dark line that you see shows the um, change in the overall index relative to the zero line for that particular country. And then the colored bars show you the uh, change in individual goals that are given in the legend there. And these are the 15 countries or regions with the largest increases. So Mozambique had the largest overall average increase in its index um, score over this time period. And you can see that uh, that was driven by an increase in the sense of place goal, which is in particular because they created a number of marine protected areas over the last five years, which helped boost their lasting special places goal or sub-goal, as well as um, increases in their natural products score. And they also had increases in uh, food provision, clean water, and uh, biodiversity, which are very, very small. And then minor declines in tourism and recreation. But and overall, you can see uh, several goals really drove uh, the increase in overall score for Mozambique. And you can look down this list and you can see that in general, the, the countries that did really well had most of the goals increased and it had a few of the goals with strong increases in particular driven by um, increases in tourism and recreation for several of these countries, increases in sense of place for the top scoring countries, which again is from implementation in marine protected areas, and increases in the natural products goals. So those three were really drivers of change for these top scoring countries. You can look at the bottom scoring ones, the ones that had the largest decreases and see similar um, patterns emerging. Again, the black line is the average index score change with the colored bars showing you goal contribution here. And in this case, uh, the declines in natural products and tourism recreation were the main drivers of change for almost all of these ones that saw strong declines. We also saw several of the lowest scoring ones um, lose coastal protection from coastal habitats, as well as um, for Eritrea, uh, a strong decline in coastal livelihoods and economies. Some of the goals increased, as you can see. So this is sort of highlights the fact that if um, policy could address and mitigate the, the declines in just a few of these key goals, 
they would actually be able to turn themselves around because several of the other goals were actually increasing and that would help pull their score up. And then finally in these plots, we just picked a few representative ones in the middle to highlight that these are ones that basically saw very little change in their overall um, index score, uh, but you can see some had almost no change in any of the goals. For example, jo Johnston at Atoll and Jarvis Island, you, almost no goals changed at all, so the index was stayed the same. And you have other countries um, like Cook Islands, Egypt, Sao Tome and Principe, and Lithuania that had large changes in goals in both directions. Uh, so kind of highlighting the fact that uh, any particular score overall index score change you see can be driven by quite a lot of combinations of individual goal score changes that can indicate potential trade-offs that are occurring with one goal going up at the cost of another or vice versa or very very similar changes in overall index score caused by very very different changes in underlying goal scores which uh, we think is um, part of what is the the strength of being able to assess uh, overall ocean health in this way that allows you to dive deeper is the, the individual index score is useful for um, communicating what's going on in the big picture, but you really need to be able to look under the hood to understand what's driving those scores and uh, think about what policy might help improve ocean health. So that's the big picture and results. I want to spend a, a few slides on what we learned about the uh, index itself and then uh, provide some wrap-up just to end with. So um, like I said, the index is constructed in a way that accounts for both the current status and our likely future status, with the likely future status indicated by the combination of recent trends, pressures, and resilience measures applied to the current status to indicate where we think it will likely be in five years' time. So to test how well we do, we can see you know, how uh, well scores in 2012, predicted scores in 2016. So this is overall scores, uh, which um, includes both current status and likely future state, and it shows a very tight relationship as would be predicted that um, where you were before is a pretty good prediction of where you will be in five years' time. You can see some of those uh, outliers highlighted here. These are ones that saw really large changes in their scores due to a number of reasons that um, led the previous score to be not as good of a predictor of the past score, but in a way that was, was making sense. But this is the overall score. It really doesn't tell you um, what's going on with the uh, way that the index is constructed. So this is a um, focus on that. It's saying, what did um, the likely future status from the 2012 assessment how did it compare to the observed current status from the 2016 assessment? So this is if our index framework were perfect, uh, then you would see a perfect fit here. And it's a pretty strong relationship. You can see there's obviously some scatter. It's not uh, along the red line, which would be kind of the perfect uh, uh, prediction. But it's doing pretty well with some anticipated um, scatter around that. But uh, even that uh, has some sort of inertia built into it, into what the underlying data are. And so we wanted to um, dive a little bit deeper and see how the um, predicted change in status compared to the observed change in status from the um, underlying uh, framework. And as you dive deeper and deeper into seeing how the uh, index performs, it, this relationship starts to fall apart a little bit or maybe a lot, you'd say. Um, there's still a loose pattern here of the predicted change doing OK at um, predicting the observed change, but it's a lot weaker, uh, if present at all. Um, and as we dug into this, it, it became clear that uh, part of the, the main reason that you don't see as strong a relationship, in, not surprisingly, is the underlying data. So I don't have plots on this, but the, the goals that had um, much better data, a higher resolution both spatially and temporally, and higher quality of reporting, had much stronger uh, relationships in the ability for the um, predicting change in status to be observed uh, in the actual outcome. So uh, we feel like the index is um, 
for those cases where the da underlying data are, are reasonably good. It's doing a quite a good job at um, anticipating where things will be in the future, suggesting that the way we've structured the framework is working pretty well, but it really still suffers the problem that every indicator suffers of what the quality of the input data are. And then the final thing I want to um, focus on in terms of testing how the, the index performs, and this is more of a general uh, kind of view of things, is asking um, how changes in score relate to changes in ranks. And because what motivated this is a lot of people look at where their country ranks as an, a sort of a way of indicating how well they're doing. It's a natural outcome of providing scores as people want to know how well they ranked uh, compared to other countries. And uh, we've seen this critique brought to many parts of the index that the rankings don't make sense for what they would expect. So one way we wanted to look at that is to look at how well changes in scores predict changes in rank or vice versa. So this plot shows that comparison over the five years of assessment. And you can see that in general, changes in scores do predict changes in ranks pretty well, as I guess one would expect it. But there's a, some really important uh, outliers, and as you get further away from the zero, the scatter gets bigger and bigger, so you get less able to predict um, changes in rank with changes in scores as you get further away, larger changes. And then just two points to make that are cautionary tales about using ranks or changes in ranks to tell you how well you're doing is these two uh, highlighted examples of the Gilbert Islands and the Republic of Congo, where they had nearly identical changes in score, about uh, loss of about seven points, but very different changes in ranks at uh, delta of about negative eight to negative 78 or something like that in rank. So really, really different changes in ranks. And then further to highlight this point in the center, you see these cases, 12 of them where you got a decline in score but an increase in rank, and four of them where you got an increase in score but a decline in rank. And so I just, we still think that the absolute score is much more meaningful as a, a measure of how well uh, oceans are doing and, and what changes in oceans mean. Um, so just a, a note about how to use or not use ranks. And then the final thing we wanted to do is sort of see how well the um, index compares to other kind of measures of, of ocean condition that people use. Uh, we did this in our first assessment as well. So these are three other um, kinds of measures that people often use to think about how coasts and oceans are doing. So the Human Development Index, the Cumulative Human Impact Assessment that uh, Steve showed you at the beginning, and just general coastal population. And uh, these are really uh, encouraging and intuitive results, I guess, that you know, as uh, human development index scores increase, you're getting stronger governance, social economic institutions, and you get higher index scores. This makes a lot of sense, but bears fruit in this analysis. With uh, cumulative human impact, as human impact increases, you get a general decline in ocean health index scores. This also makes sense. And then as coastal population increases, uh, you get a decline in uh, ocean health index score, again, just with more people on the coastlines, that's more pressure on coastal systems. So we're seeing um, a general convergence of uh, what the ocean health index tells us with these other indicators, but we think in a more comprehensive way. Uh, a few slides on individual goals. I'll go quickly because this is really something you should go to the website and dive into, but we can see uh, on the top the global country scores for artisanal fishing opportunity, and, and on the right, the distribution of those scores per country and region. And then for food provision on the bottom, you've seen generally higher scores for the artisanal fishing opportunity globally, although some uh, much lower scores in the um, Coral Triangle and Africa region. And for food provision, a, a lot of places that still have a lot of room for improvement for wild-caught fisheries management and for more sustainable aquaculture production. And if you um, look in particular at the food provision score, the one on the, the left is what I showed you before, but you, on the right you can see the trends that are driving changes for several countries with um, some encouraging but small positive changes for the Coral Triangle and South Pacific uh, with some declines in the South, other parts of the South Pacific and South America that maybe um, suggest a need for 
a greater intervention in, um, in particular wild-caught fisheries management. Okay, quick wrap up, wrap up, and then uh, I got a few minutes for questions. So uh, as we saw, like global ocean health index score is pretty stable over time, and what we'd say is okay. It's not too bad, but it's not great. There's plenty of room for improvement. Um, we see larger changes in um, individual goal scores globally and country scores individually and, of course, goal scores within countries. As would be expected, that's where you're going to get greater and greater variation because you have stronger influence of individual um, goal components at that scale. We saw uh, encouraging improvements in some fisheries aspects and, and a pretty rapid increase in marine protected areas around the world that have driven many of the increases we saw in ocean health index scores. And the declines in natural products in particular drove many of the large decreases. And as I pointed out, the, you know, these changes can happen in opposite directions, often balancing each other out, not always indicating trade-offs. There's It doesn't have to be a direct causation that led one to go up and the other to go down, but it suggests there might be some trade-offs that are worth uh, digging into to understand what's going on. And then, I, you know, the index we think performs well as an indicator. The framework underlying it seems to be robust when the data underlying it are reasonably well, but as with any indicator, we still um, suffer the problem of uh, poor input data really constrain what we can learn. It's better than not doing anything. We really strongly believe that some data is better than no data, but there's still a, a pretty strong global need to improve our monitoring and assessment of the many different dimensions of um, global ocean health. So, you know, composite indicators always face this challenge of, of updating and comparison. Steve alluded to this at the beginning. When you um, imp get, get new information, new data through time, um, you, you have to update those components, but that means you have to then update past assessments in order to be able to do comparisons. It's a, a strength of using the best available science, but it's always a challenge in staying current and uh, making sure people understand what has changed and hasn't changed. But we're, we're now at an opportunity. We've got five years of assessment. We're continuing to do these global assessments, and we're starting to get um, you know, a real, at least beginning insights as to what is driving uh, changes in global ocean health uh, at global and regional scales. And this, we hope and we think, will help um, guide further policy and intervention to improve ocean health in particular places. Uh, the lessons learned, I think, are many, but I'll just you know, highlight the, the fact that uh, conservation measures like uh, in uh, putting marine protected areas in place have had substantial benefit to many different countries across many of their goals. Uh, and so conservation is a key strategy for improving ocean health, but there's a real need to improve um, the sustainable delivery of these benefits to people as well. So when that's done effectively, like improved fisheries management that brings more food to the plate more sustainably for people, that's good for the ocean and good for people. And so we really need to be thinking comprehensively about how we um, approach ocean health. We're doing lots of independent assessments. I encourage you to go to our website. It's there at the bottom, ohi-science.org, and the projects to learn a lot more about the different ones that have been completed, that are under underway, that we're leading, and that many other people are leading. We call these OHI Plus assessments, or the independent assessments. There's more than 20 of them going around, I think maybe 25 now, in, on all seven continents. So it's, it's really um, taking off in a lot of places which is great for kind of learning additional lessons from what people are doing in other places. We have this uh, fantastic resource, uh, ohiscience.org, that um, gives you all of our results, allows you to um, dig through them, download the data. We have a huge online resource manual, frequently asked questions. All of our code, all of our data uh, are here, so I please encourage you to visit there to dive in and learn, learn more. And I apologize for running a little bit long. We don't have a whole lot of time for questions. But um, thank you very much for your time and eager to get feedback either now or offline directly through email. So thank you.
Okay, great. Thank you so much, Ben and Steve. Um, this was great. Um, are you guys able to stay a couple minutes after? We can tackle yes, these. Yes, I can. Take questions. Yes, it's okay. okay. All right, because we have a bunch of great questions. Um, one question a couple of people had is, um, can you, are there any specific things you would attribute the change in natural products scores to? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's um, definitely speaks to a data quality issue. So, natural products information is reported to by countries to FAO, and so this is there's six products. There's um, like fish oil, seaweed, sponges, shells, coral, uh, one or two others, um, and there's just a perennial problem with countries not uh, fully or accurately reporting those data. It's in order to calculate that goal, we need to know both the, um, the sort of the biomass, the weight that's harvested, and kind of build that into a sustainable harvest model that we use, as well as the the value, the dollar value of those products because we weight the contribution of each individual product by its economic value. And there's just a lot of uh, challenges in those data, I guess is the most generous way of putting it. So uh, to really understand what's going on with that goal, you have to dig into an individual country, see which products were harvested there, which ones were changed, and then try to understand what's going on with those changes. Some changes may be due to actually intentionally decreasing harvest to make it more sustainable and we wouldn't know that without diving into the detailed regulations and rules that are going on in that country. Some of it may be declines because they've over harvested and it's taxed out. Some of it could be changes because markets dynamics have changed and that uh, certainly is relevant but not as worrisome as a decline in actual natural resource. So it's a um, it's something that clearly is happening, but we don't know if it's how much of it's data poor data quality or how much of it is actual um, uh, concerns about declines in the natural resource. And I could add to that that um, independent assessments may be able to use other natural products that aren't reported to FAO but that are tracked uh, at the national level that could be inserted into this goal. Uh, and tailored to that particular region. Okay, okay, thank you guys. Um, another question is how uh, does the in index incorporate climate change related factors such as ocean warming, acidification, and sea level rise? Yep, so almost all of the goals uh, are affected by climate change as the pressures. So mm -hmm. I remember the index has the current status against a reference point the recent trends over the past five years, and then these cumulative pressures that um, affect what we th where we think the likely future state will be, and that likely future state is half of, half of the score. So uh, we have a number of pressures that are affecting each goal, but climate pressures from acidification, sea level rise, ocean warming, UV radiation are all factors that influence each of the goals um, in a goal-specific way. So some goals are more affected by climate stressors than others, and we account for that in the methodology that we, we use. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, are differences between goals and indicators um, for, each, um, for each particular region accommodated in the model? So can you have different goals and indicators for different regions? Um, I, the answer really basically is no uh, at the global level. So the global uh, um, assessment is based on global data and those data have to be the same for every country in order to be used for the global study. Um, there are some places that do not have certain goals. For example, they may not have fishing or they may not have um, something else. And in that case, um, that is not weighted as a zero, but it is just not counted as part of the average. However, um, the weights of goals and the different goals, and it's conceivable even a different goal could be added at, at the independent study level. So it, you, you see what I mean, I hope. Yeah, let me just try saying it one other way, just because I think it's a really important question and a really important point is uh, the goals for any particular region are 
only assessed if they're relevant to that area. So as Steve said, if you're an uninhabited remote island, then you're not going to be assessed on your coastal livelihoods and economies because you don't have a coastal population that, that's doing that. So the goals are included or excluded from the assessment depending on what's relevant to a particular place. When you zoom in and do your own independent assessment for a particular place, we strongly encourage you to start from the beginning and say what are the goals that are relevant to this particular place and you may have ones that are unique to that region that weren't considered globally or in any of the other independent assessments that are going on but are important there and you add them in and then you drop any ones that are not uh, relevant to that particular place. So the framework we think is universal but the application of it is always tailored to the context and the scale at which you're working. That was better. <laughs> well, thank you both. Um, so I, I just want to say you've received several compliments. Uh, like, thank you so much for the great presentation and uh, loved your depictions and explanations of data associated with each goal. Uh, I'll, let you, I'll send you guys those comments so you can read them later. Uh, a couple more questions. Um, is over, um, there are three indicators for fisheries. Um, which include fisheries. Is fisheries double or triple counted in the index? So as no. Steve, yeah, no. As Steve said at the beginning, like you, there are different ways that um, the harvest of fish matters to people for food on their plate, for the coastal economies that they provide, and in uh, some cases for the artisanal opportunities that derive from access to that resource. And so. Uh, in some cases, we use the same underlying data for those things, but we are deriving different uh, measures from it, and we don't think that's double counting. It's actually it's just using the best available data uh, in different ways to give us a sense of these different goals. But often, it's actually different dimensions of the same data. So for the fisheries one, we use catch estimates for that biomass in food provision. We use um, the trade information for uh, the value of fisheries and the economies side of stuff and there's separate measures for the number of people fishing that gives you an assessment of the um, jobs and livelihood that are derived from fishing. So even though it's the same human activity, there are different measures that are derived from that activity that feed into the goals in different ways. So uh, we've been really careful and deliberate about uh, the issue of double counting and it's not we don't think there's any double counting in the index we do use an individual data layer more than once sometimes but in ways that are appropriate and and intentional okay thank you um, do you expect uh, or have you seen any clear impact on the index scores uh, for the, of the recent creation of mega MPAs such as the Ross Sea Mexico Hawaii and and others Yes. Um, we saw a sudden rise in scores for um, the South Georgia and Shetland Islands, if I remember several years ago. And well, why was that? Well, it turned out they had created a very large um, marine protected area, and um, that explained it. So we are seeing um, all, all of the different uh, protections, whether it's uh, marine areas or sometimes coastal areas and sometimes um, areas that are culturally important uh, which feed into the sense of place goal. All of those protections do accrue to scores. Just one um, additional point on that. There's a, a cap to how much credit you can get for these large NPAs because of the way that we set a reference point for that uh, the way that MPAs play into this assessment. So we have a target of 30% of your waters being protected and once you get to 30% that's essentially the perfect score. You can't do any better. So if you create even larger MPAs it's not going to give you a higher score on the lasting special places goal which is what really is where it drives it but you will continue to get additional benefit for the resilience to natural systems provided by larger MPAs across many of the other goals. So there's a, uh, you'll get a stronger increase and we've seen that up to that 30% uh, 
kind of threshold, and then it starts to slow way down because you're only getting additional credit uh, in the way that MPAs provide resilience to the other goals. Okay, great. One last question. Uh, going big picture, um, have your results? Have you seen your results influence any positive change in decision making? Yes. Um, as one example, um, Columbia um, created a whole new blue agenda as a result of actually embarrassment because their score was lower than they thought it, um, than they wanted it. So that's one case, and um, there are many others like that. And Ben alluded to the fact that the global scores are all comparable country to country, and those those rankings actually do incentivize uh, competition. Um, but in fact, the real management um, impact of all of this stuff comes when countries do their own studies and compare their own progress over time. And those uh, independent studies are not comparable to any other study. So yes, it does have um, cloud um, both in, in uh, creating some pride at a country doing well and some embarrassment um, and incentive to do better in countries that score uh, not as well as they wish and have the resources to dedicate to, and time to dedicate to this. Ben, do you have anything to add to that? No, that was a great answer. Well, okay. I, I'd like to say one thing in, in closing. Um, ben and I got to uh, honor and um, pleasure of presenting, but um, as you've already seen, loads of people have contributed to this project in many, many ways, and uh, we can't name them all here, but I, d I do want to give a shout out to um, the Ocean Health Index um, Director, Johanna Polsenberg at Conservation International, and um, to Julie Stewart Lowndes for um, doing the slides for the show and to Melanie Fraser, who's the senior analyst at NCS, um, for um, all the data work that she does and for helping so much with um, slides and graphics here and in the various websites. So um, it really has taken a community and uh, we're grateful to everyone and also to um, the funders uh, both um, at Conservation International and NCS, and uh, a particular shout out to Pacific Life Foundation who for the past five years has been the founding presenting sponsor for the Ocean Health Index. Okay, great. Thank you so much, guys. Um, and I'm going to send you a follow-up report because we've got even more good questions afterwards, but we need to close up now. And thank you to everyone who was able to attend today. And I should have said this earlier before some people had to hop off, but we're having another webinar, follow-up webinar on the Ocean Health Index uh, in a few weeks. So uh, stay tuned for that announcement uh, uh, from the EBM Tools Network. Um, and thank you so much, and uh, we hope uh, you guys, have, everyone has a good rest of their day. Okay. Thank, you. thank you. Bye, Sarah. Bye, Nick.